Hello, my name is Mikołaj Bojanczyk. I'm from Warsaw, and I would like to uh, present a, a paper about extensions of Omega regular languages, which we wrote together with Edon Kelmendi, currently in Oxford, Rafał Stefański in Warsaw, and Georg Cecze in Kaiserslautern. So the starting point of our work is the seminal theorem of Büchi, which says that monadic second order logic over omega, so the natural numbers, with their ordering is decidable. Now, this has prompted the question, how far can you go beyond that? What can you add to MSO, monadic second order logic, over the natural numbers so that it continues to be decidable? And this question has uh, been around since the very beginning, in fact, since even before the beginning, because some of the papers that I will cite will date from before Buhi's result. So let's discuss some natural ideas for extension. One idea is what kind of functions from natural numbers to natural numbers can you add? So already in 1958, in the first paper that I know of which mentions MSO and the decision problem by Robinson, it is shown that the doubling function leads to an undecidable logic. A similar result was later discovered by uh, Elgot and Rabin, who showed that a squaring function or a cubing function, all of those lead to undecidable logics. And there was a later investigation which uh, what kind of conditions are sufficient for a function so that MSO becomes undecidable. And the idea is that, for example, if every uh, number has a finite inverse image, then that's going to be sufficient for undecidable. So the typical pattern here is that unless your fun uh, function is obviously definable, well, or, non no, or non-obviously definable in MSO, it will usually lead to an undecidable logic. If you go from function to a simpler setup, so you input a rat natural, natural number, but the output just a yes-no value, so unary predicates, then the landscape changes. Of course, unary predicates can be seen as a special case of functions, because it's a function which inputs natural numbers and outputs yes-no, but uh, this perspective allows you to focus on different kinds of uh, properties. And here the main kind of idea is that there will usually be decidable. So this is a line of research that has uh, received a, a lot of attention. And for example, uh, if you take the squ squaring, but not as a unary function, but as a yes-no property, then the logic is decidable, despite squaring itself not being definable in MSO. Another example, this is a nice interesting example, is a prime predicate. So you input a natural number and you say whether or not it's a prime number. This logic is decidable, it turns out, uh, assuming a number uh, theoretic uh, conjecture called the uh, Schinzer's hypothesis. Uh, note that in the log uh, in MSO you can express, for example, the twin primes conjecture because you can say there exists an infinite set of numbers. Well, the infinite set of prime numbers contains infinitely many pairs of the form x and x plus 2. So uh, if there would be, if Schinzer's hypothesis would be true, and there, therefore there would be such an algorithm, then you could just r run uh, this algorithm on the twin primes conjecture and get an answer, which I believe is going to be a yes for uh, this particular conjecture, but I'm not sure. Uh, here, as long as you don't write obviously undecidable predicates, such as predicates, for example, which are just undecidable, so there's no algorithm which uh, inputs x and tells you whether or not p of x holds, and there should be a little bit more than just undecidability, but as long as you have some reasonable decidability assumptions, which were formalized in, uh, by, uh, in later papers, then you're going to get a decidable logic. Uh, another line of research is adding a quantifier. So let me give you an example about uncountability. Imagine you have a property phi, phi of x, which is, is, is a property of sets, and then you want to say that the family of sets which satisfy this property is uncountable. This, it turns out, is a decidable uh, extension, and it's because you can rewrite phi of x into a new formula, which uh, MSO formula, which expresses the uh, quantifier qx phi of x. So, although not somehow directly uh, available in MSO, the uncountability quantifier can be added to MSO without changing the expressive power of the logic. Another result is a probabilistic quantifier. Imagine you have your probability phi of x and then 
So some sets satisfy it, some sets don't. And you imagine you draw a set at random using a coin flipping measure. So for each position on the natural numbers, you independently toss a coin, and the coin result tells you if you add that position to your set or not. This gives you a distribution on sets of natural numbers, and therefore you can ask whether or not it is almost surely true, probability 1, that phi of x satisfies this property. This is a logic which is undecidable, and which follows uh, directly from a result by Bayer, Grösser, and Bertrand from 2012, which says that the emptiness problem for probabilistic Büchi automata with the almost surely acceptance condition is, uh, is undecidable, and this uh, result can be easily encoded in MSO, and therefore the logic, re resulting logic is undecidable. Here is another example of a quantifier called U, which talks about boundedness. So the quantifier works as follows. Imagine you have a property phi of x of sets. Now think of phi as expressing a property of infinite sets, oh sorry, of finite sets. And then the quantifier says that there are un sides of sets of unbounded size which satisfy phi. So for example, if uh, phi is true for at least one infinite set, then this holds trivially, but the uh, really interesting cases where phi is true only for finite sets, and then you just want to, see, want to say that the sets which make it true have unbounded size. Now, this quantifier is uh, similarly to the almost surely one. It's kind of prefix independent. Small perturbations of, uh, of a set will not affect uh, whether or not it's, it's, it's true, and therefore it's harder to code arithmetic in it. Uh, but it can be done. So it, it, the logic, res resulting logic, which is called MSO plus U, is undecidable, which is something that we saw together with Pavel Paris and Shimon Torunchik in 2016. So there's this line of research of adding quantifiers. Here's yet another thing you can add to MSO, which is unary predicates over sets. So these are, previously I discussed first order predicates, so the predicate inputs a number and tells you yes or no. Now you input a set of numbers and say yes or no. Uh, and uh, so this generalizes first order predicates uh, in a rather straightforward way. Uh, well, it's easy to see that first order predicates are a special case, but you get much more uh, here than with just first order predicates. So what kind of f uh, second order predicates can you add. So here's one example, which is that a set is periodic. So I'll say period 3 or 4. This can be shown to be undecidable without great difficulty by using the periods to represent uh, computa computations of, say, Turing machines. And it's also true for uh, uh, relaxation which is ultimate periodicity, so you're periodic with finitely many exceptions. Now, when you go from periodic to ultimately periodic, you allow these uh, finitely many exceptions, and always adding finitely many exceptions makes things harder to get an undecidability proof going, because the part of the computation of the Turing machine which you care about might be covered by those finitely many exceptions, and it's hard to put a finger on it. So it's, it's much, much harder to show, but it will turn out to be undecidable as well. Here's another property of sets, which is called U. It's not an, not an accident that it's the same U as in the first line, because it's also connected to unboundedness. So imagine the following property of a set. You input a set, and then you look at the intervals contained in the set. So an interval is a, a, set, a, a set of consecutive positions, and you want to say that uh, the intervals have unbounded size, So which means you can go for arbitrarily long a time without seeing a gap in the set X. Uh, this logic, it turns out to be the same thing as the quantifier U as above, and that's why I called it also U. Uh, it has the same expressive power, and therefore it's undecidable. And also using these results, one can show that the ultimately periodic quantifier leads to an undecidable logic. So here, uh, it turns out that you, you, you can get quite a few undecidable extensions. And in fact, uh, with respect to set predicates, I'm not aware of any robust set predicates which would lead to a decidable logic and uh, would not be uh, decidable in MSO. Well, this, this paper is, is devoted to actually trying to answer this question quite precisely. So what kind of set predicates can you add? And we'll see uh, an answer in a moment in our main theorem. Our main theorem is as follows. Consider a language that is not omega regular and which has a neutral letter. I will explain neutral letters in a moment, but the idea is that a language is supposed to be seen as a set predicate. So 
You can think of a set of natural numbers as an omega word over a two-letter alphabet, plus, minus, yes, no. And uh, generally speaking, uh, language L can be seen as a, as a, as a, as a predicate which, uh, which inputs a, a word that can be seen as a, a tuple of sets. So you should think of, about L as representing a second-order set predicate. And you can add this second-order set predicate, uh, this second-order predicate to MSO and ask about the resulting, resulting logic. So our theorem says as, that as long as the set predicate has, has a certain uh, robustness condition, which is uh, formalized by this neutral letter to be explained in a moment, then you're going to get an undecidable logic. So let me explain in more detail what the, uh, are the concepts used in this theorem. So first of all, a neutral letter, it means that there is a distinguished letter in the alphabet such that uh, removing or adding finitely or infinitely many occurrences of that letter does not affect membership in the language. What does MSO plus L mean? It means the following. The language L can be viewed as a predicate. So as follows, if you have an omega word over a, a letter alphabet sigma, which has n letters, you can represent this omega word as n sets. The first set, it tells you which positions have the first letter. The second set tells you which positions have the second letter, and so on, up until the last nth letter in the alphabet. So you can view a language L as a predicate which inputs an n tuple of sets. You could be a little bit more compressed and instead of having n sets, you could have uh, log n sets if you use binary encoding of letters, but this is not going to be important for us. We'll, we will consider alphabets which have like two or three letters anyway. And finally, by undecidable, we mean the uh, MSO plus L theory. So uh, the undecidable problem is going to be you input a sentence of the logic MSO plus L. So MSO with Boolean combination, set quantification, and first order quantification. And you're also allowed to use this uh, uh, predicate uh, L of x1 up to xn. And then the algorithm is going to tell you if your given sentence is true. So we prove that this is going to be undecidable, assuming this robustness property of L uh, formalized by the neutral letter and that it's not omega regular. So here's a corollary. It's about full trios. It says, consider a class of omega language which is closed under Boolean combinations, including complementation, and which is closed under images of rational relations for omega words. Such a class is called a full trio, usually studied for finite words, but it also makes sense for omega words. So what's a rational relation? Imagine you have a Büchy automaton where every transition is labeled by an input word and an output word, where both the input word and the output word could be empty. So this allows for epsilon transitions. If you have such a Büchy automaton, then you can think of it as generating a set of, in of pairs, input omega word and output omega words. And such a relation would, uh, would set of pairs was going to be a rational relation. And then a closure property is going to be that if your class T contains a language L, then for every rational relation R, you have all uh, the language, which is the image of L under the relation R, is going to belong to T. Since rational relations are symmetric, it doesn't matter if you talk about images or pre-images. So the corollary is that if you have such a full trio, then if it contains at least one non-regular language, non-omega regular language, then it is going, this class is going to be undecided. And this is cor corollary is easily proved from our main theorem uh, because uh, all of the mechanics of MSO plus L can be encoded using uh, Boolean combinations and images and the rational relations. And the neutral letter uh, uh, assumption is, is, is corresponds to the fact that a um, rational relation can erase neutral letters. This result, the, the corollary about full trios, is something that was already shown. So there's a, this, the motivation for our work is a theorem. The original, uh, the journal version is 2017 by Georg Zetsche, Dietrich Kuske, and Markus Lorai, which said that for full trios of languages in, of finite words, so if you have a class of languages of finite words, which is closed under Boolean combinations and images under rational relations, then if it contains at least one non-regular language, then it is undecidable. And in fact, they show not only is it undecidable, but it contains entire arithmetic hierarchy. So all decidable languages or co-decidable co languages, uh, sorry, semi-decidable languages and co-semi-decidable languages and so on. 
uh, the way they show it is that they prove that uh, a full trio, a Boolean closed full trio, has enough logical strength to internalize notions such as my, uh, such as my funeral, the equivalence. So once you have one non-regular language and the my Hilner Rode theorem tells you that that language is going to have infinitely many equivalence classes under my Hilner Rode equivalent, then you use that fact and the ability to formalize this argument in the logic itself to show that you have uh, the language A and B N, and then once you have that, then you can easily get undecidability, and once you have an encodings of Turing machines, then you can have the entire arithmetic hierarchy by using images under rational relations and Boolean combinations. We try to do the same here as well. But it is more challenging for omega ones. Why is it more challenging? Because of the role of Michael Nerodi equivalence. So there is no such thing as a good Michael Nerodi theorem for omega words. There are some close things, but none of them are good enough to repeat the argument uh, about that, that, that I just cited before. So let me start with one which is called right congruence. So uh, Consider right congruence where you, you, you start out with a language L of omega words, but you use it to define an equivalence relation on finite words. So you say that two finite words, think of them as prefixes, W and W prime, are equivalent with respect to right congruence if for every possible future V, appending this future V, it's an omega word the future, to W and W prime gives you the same result with respect to L. So that's a well-defined equivalence relation. It is a congruence in the sense that if you have two equivalent finite words and then you append to both of them the same letter, then they continue to be equivalent or even the same, same, same finite word. So it's a congruence in this sense. Uh, and what you can show is that if you have a language that has finitely many equivalence classes for right congruence, then the same is true for every language definable in MSO plus L. So the mechanics of MSO plus L do not... Uh, go beyond having finite many equivalence classes of right congruence. Now this in and of itself would not be bad news, in fact this is also true for finite words, but the difference is that for finite words having a right congruence with finite many equivalence classes is the be-all end-all of regularity. So you're regular if and only if you have finite many equivalences of right congruence. This is not true for omega words. There exist languages, in fact many languages of omega words, which have infinite, which have finitely many classes for right congruence and nevertheless are undecidable. In fact, every prefix independent language of omega words is going to have finitely many equivalence classes of right congruence. In fact, it's going to have just one equivalence class of right congruence. So it's as bad as it can be. And you can come up with lots of interesting, difficult and obviously undecidable languages of omega words which are prefix independent. For example, words which represent an accepting computation of a Turing machine with finitely many mistakes or stuff like that. So here's one example of a language which has finitely many equivalence classes of right congruence, the language U. So this is the same as the set predicate U that I have decided de de described before. So think of a set of, um, of, of positions described as a word with some with letters plus and minus. So plus means I belong to the set, minus means I don't belong to the set. And you want to say that blocks of pluses have unbounded size. Oh, it should be plus, not b. Then this language has five, is, is prefix independent and therefore it has finitely many, in fact one equivalence class with respect to right congruence. So it's as bad as it can be and by the fact that I cited above, MSO plus this language L, so it, you could call it MSO plus U, is going to have uh, every language in, definable in that logic is going to have uh, finitely many equivalence classes for right congruence. MSO plus U, you might think that it's ambiguous because it's is it MSO plus the quantifier U or is it MSO plus the language U? But in fact, uh, these logics turn out to be equivalent, so it's, it is in fact the same logic, uh, so it's, it's not ambiguous. However, despite defining only languages with finitely many equivalence classes for right congruence, the logic MSO plus U is undecidable, as I mentioned before. So you're going to have to go a little bit beyond just right congruence. Uh, right, Two-sided congruence, as opposed to just right congruence, do not solve the problem, because at some point you have to account for the fact that you have infinitely many words and do something with that. And 
this we have to do that and this is what we do in this paper so let me just give you a little bit of a glimpse of what kind of things we need to do so the idea is that we show that MSO plus U is somehow the least undecidable language so we show that if you take an omega regular language with a neutral letter then in fact the logic MSO plus L will contain the logic MSO plus U and therefore it will be undecidable by virtue of containing an undecidable logic and how do we show that well we use something which is called the congruence game so this is the last thing I wanted to explain now and it works as follows it's supposed to be something like the Michael Nerodi theorem but for omega words and in a way which speaks about unboundedness so let me explain it to you in more detail consider the following game imagine you have a set of natural numbers so some pluses and minuses so plus means belongs to the set minus does not belong and the idea is that we want to express that it has the property u which means it has intervals of unbounded size which means it has blocks of plus of unbounded size but we're going to formalize this as a game which uses our non-regular language l and it's going to work as follows so there's going to be two players duplicator and spoiler duplicator claims that there are intervals of unbounded size and spoiler disagrees and the game is played as follows in the first round spoiler picks a family of those disjoint intervals they don't have to overlap with the plus pluses or minuses just in uh, infinitely many disjoint intervals the intuition is that spoiler in order to win should pick intervals of unbounded size in the second round duplicator picks an infinite subset of spoilers family so typically it's going to be the smaller sets in the family but this is usually going to be impossible because they're all going to be large and then interleaved with this blue red intervals are going to be some blue intervals and the uh, and they also they have to be uh, contained in X so they the, the blue intervals need to have pluses as well now the intuition is that if duplicator wants to win then the blue intervals should have at least the same size as the preceding red intervals and therefore if it's if, if duplicator wants to win then there should be large numbers of consecutive pluses because otherwise he will not be able to match the red intervals of unbounded size with blue intervals of same size that consist only of pluses once these duplicator has played the blue and red intervals so the red intervals are really dictated by spoiler and it's the blue intervals that are chosen by duplicator the game continues with a few more rounds as follows in round three spoiler picks finite words that fit in the red intervals so the longer are the, the inter red intervals are the more space he will have to fit a complicated word in them uh, he's not doesn't need to exhaust the entire red interval so if a red interval has 10 positions he can use a word of three letters if, 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 if this is useful and the intuition is that in order to win spoiler wants to see every finite word infinitely often and since finite words can be uh, very long he wants to use long intervals duplicator needs to respond with uh, words in the blue intervals uh, which also need to fit and the idea is that in order to win duplicator wants to copy in the uh, blue interval the same word as spoiler used in the first word this is just the intuition but how is it formalized it's formalized by the last and fifth round which is that spoiler picks infinitely many pairs of red word from round three and blue word from round four in a matching way so uh, a pair of uh, red blue another pair of red blue another pair of red blue and the idea is that they that the blue should be equal to the red which is uh, enforced by the winning condition of the game which says that duplicator wins if and only if the red omega word concatenate ob obtained by concatenating or or red words is in the language if and only if uh, the blue omega, uh, omega word is in the language and one can show uh, that the language this this game has the following property that duplicator has a winning strategy if and only if the set x has intervals of unbounded size and therefore it satisfies property u and the game is designed so that it can be formalized in the logic mso plus l which proves that if mso plus l if l is a non-regular language uh, because this assumes that the language is non-regular if the language is non-regular then you can in fact encode mso plus u and therefore the logic MSO plus L is non uh, is undecidable because it's at least as strong as MSO plus U. So this completes the description of our paper, which shows that if you add any pro non-regular property to MSO, any non-regular language, 
uh, under a technical assumption of having a neutral letter, then you get the logic MSO plus U, and therefore you are undecided. Uh, thank you. <laughs>